Hi, my name is Jeff Petraga, and I'm an educator at the DNA Learning Center. Today, I'm here to tell you about one of my favorite types of cells, the amazing neurons. Neurons are cells of the animal nervous systems that are capable of sending electrochemical signals all around the animal's body, allowing them to perceive information about the internal and external world, process that information, and then coordinate a response. Now, neurons have many special structural features that allow them to act as these electrochemical messengers. Let's check some of those out. Okay, so here we have a typical neuron, and it looks pretty crazy with all these weird branches and whatnot coming off of it, but remember, at the end of the day, it's still just a cell. And like other cells, it has a nucleus, which contains genetic information, and it also has other organelles, such as mitochondria. Now, usually these organelles are concentrated down here in what's known as the cell body or the soma. And then projecting from that cell body in this neuron, we have what are called the dendrites. The largest projection is very often going to be what we, what we call the axon. It's not always necessarily the most obvious projection, but in this neuron, it certainly is. And that axon projects away from the cell body and reaches this other region of little branches, which are called telodendria. The telodendria have these little buttony knob things at the end of them, which are referred to as synaptic terminals or boutons. And then right at the start of the axon, we have this little, almost like, like the neck of the neuron, I guess you could say, that is referred to as the axon hillock. And the reason that I point that out is because the way that signals are propagated in the nervous system is that this neuron will receive chemical signals from a second neuron that would be connected to it in the form of what are called neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters will bind to receptors on the dendrites here and will cause the, uh, will generate an electrical signal in the dendrites, which will propagate through the cytoplasm of the dendrites. Those electrical signals may be either excitatory or inhibitory, basically meaning that they're going to cause a signal to be sent to this neuron or not. But assuming they're excitatory, the electrical signals will, will travel right down to the axon hillock and they'll build on top of one another and generate what is known as a graded potential. And so if this graded potential that reaches the axon hillock is large enough, what will happen is it will generate what's known as an action potential. This is an all or nothing signal that essentially will be um, sent down the axon away from the cell body and then towards the little telodendria here, towards the synaptic terminals. Once that electrical signal reaches the synaptic terminals, that will stimulate those guys to release their own neurotransmitters, which will connect to either another neuron or to a muscle or gland. And so the, that's the whole premise of how signals are sent from one neuron to another in the nervous system, basically. And um, if we get a closer look at the connection between the telodendria and the dendrites of a second neuron, we can see the presynaptic cell here in red is basically joined on the dendrites of the postsynaptic cell here in blue at these little synaptic terminals. And so the junction between the presynaptic and postsynaptic cell is called a synapse. And if we zoom in on one of those synapses, we can see that inside of the presynaptic cell, it has spent its time synthesizing and building up neurotransmitters, which it's stored in these little sacs known as vesicles. And so uh, what winds up happening is once the electrical stimulus of an action potential reaches that synaptic terminal, that presynaptic terminal, that will cause the presynaptic cell to send those vesicles to the synapse and dump their contents into the little synaptic cleft, which occurs between both of the cells. Those, the neurotransmitters that will be released through this exocytosis will then be received by receptors on the postsynaptic cell, which will then start the process all over again. And that's essentially the idea for how messages are sent through neurons in our in animal nervous systems. And so uh, the neuron, if we get a, a, a look at the uh, overall picture of the neuron that we saw before, we can see that from the axon hillock, this action potential will essentially propagate along the membranes of the axon all the way down towards the telodendria. And that's the only sort of unidirectional flow that these, ac these action potentials will travel. And so if you notice, this axon is pretty bare. So we call this unmyelinated, meaning that it lacks something called myelin. 
and myelin are little fatty deposits that are produced by what are called Schwann cells, if you're talking about uh, neurons in the peripheral nervous system, which we likely are, um, just because this neuron is, is very likely a motor neuron, meaning that it connects from central, the central nervous system to a motor unit, such as a muscle or gland. And so in the peripheral nervous system, these Schwann cells wrap themselves around the axons of uh, neurons, and they wind up secreting this myelin, this fatty myelin. And what that winds up doing is it causes these little sort of nodes to develop in between um, myelin, myelin sheaths. Those nodes are referred to as nodes of Ranvier. And so basically what this does is it forces the action the electrical signal of the action potential to essentially propagate from just these nodes, basically uh, essentially the myelin axis insulation. And what that, what that winds up doing is it winds up driving up the speed of the action potential traveling down the axon. Increasing the speed of your action potentials can really come in handy depending on the type of neuron that you are. And speaking of which, neurons can come in all different shapes and sizes. So up till now, we've been primarily looking at the motor neuron down here, but in particular, cells of the central nervous system, like these interneurons over here, can look so weird that it's hard to tell the difference between axon and dendrites. Sensory neurons look pretty strange, too. They form dendritic connections to little receptor cells, and they have these big, long axons and these weird, dually little cell bodies in the middle of their axons. And their size can be pretty variable too. So the sciatic nerve is actually the biggest neuron in our body. So the sciatic nerve connects from where your thigh connects to your torso all the way down to the bottom of your foot, which may seem pretty large, but they can get even bigger than that. So there's another nerve known as the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which occurs, which innervates the voice box or the larynx in humans and other vertebrates. And it wraps around the aorta and connects up to the vagus nerve. But in humans, it's pretty, you know, it's decently large, but nothing too crazy, not like the sciatic nerve. But if you think of an animal with a larger neck, like a giraffe, their uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve may be as long as 15 feet. But it gets even crazier than that. Since these nerves are features shared by all vertebrates, it's thought that dinosaurs, such as even the sauropod dinosaurs with these big long necks, so the apatosaurus and the supersaurus, may have had these recurrent laryngeal nerves as well, and they may have been as long as 90 feet. That's insane. That's got to be the biggest cell in history. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope that this video has shown you just how amazing neurons are, and next time we're going to be talking a little bit more about the electrochemistry of action potentials in detail. Don't forget to check out some of our other content on DNA LC Live, and have a wonderful day.